Welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Here to talk all things hockey are your hosts, Brad Crisco, Ryan Hanna, and Evan Lobsinger. I do appreciate how our, our listeners really know the cadence of this show now and when there's uh, ebbs and flows in news and, and when the Red Wings are doing well, what to expect in terms of episode topics. But the chorus of so uh, back to prospect profiles that we've been getting over the past few days has been really funny. Yeah, folks. We're back, baby. We're we're back. It's prospect profile season. You know what? March 8th, not bad. It's It feels a little bit like we're cheating because we did start them before, before the Red Wings said, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're going to make things interesting. So this does feel like the second time we're going back to prospect profiles. But we, I think we did one. Two. Two and then stopped. But I don't even feel like we should count Bedard. No. Oh. It was just, those oh, no. Are, consider those just threats, really, to the organization. Yeah, that was uh, that was just bulletin board material for the Red Wings. The, our, actually, the, the Red Wings stopped playing well. They lost those Ottawa games because we stopped doing prospect profiles. We took away the motivation. Yeah, it's our fault. As everything is. Folks, welcome to the Winged Wheel Podcast, here to talk to you about all things Detroit Red Wings hockey, the world of the NHL prospects, and everything in between. I am one of your hosts, Ryan Hanna. I'm Brad Crisco. And I'm Evan. On this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast, we are going to be regrettably talking to you about the Red Wings' past two games uh, against the Islanders and the Flyers. We're recording this on Wednesday night, just before the Chicago game, so if anything fantastic happens in that game, uh, please know that you'll hear all about it on uh, next Sunday's episode. Uh, but for now, we're going to be reviewing those two games. Uh, some Red Wings news in terms of um, uh, outside of the storylines from the games, some notes from Steve Eisenman and interviews that he's had since the trade deadline, uh, a note on Jacob Verana and uh, a couple other things. We actually have a really special interview this uh, episode. We are joined by none other than Shayna Goldman of The Athletic and Too Many Men to talk to us all about the trade deadline, her grades for the Red Wings across the league, what it was like for her to be, to be uh, breaking so many trades this year. Uh, it was a really great conversation with Shana, and then we're going to come back to you with a prospect profile. One, we're gonna we're gonna kick these back off with one in Detroit's realistic range as of now. You're gonna hear all the big names too, but this is one that you might be looking towards, and that might be a good fit for the Red Wings. And then some NHL news, if time permits. Uh, before all that, uh, a couple notes. For those of you who want to support the show, I, I was gonna make a joke at the top of the show. This is the Winged Wheel Podcast, brought to you by. If you work at a company that wants to sponsor one of the top five <laughs> hockey podcasts by listenership in America, reach out. Reach out to us. Pod at wingedwheelpodcast.com or wingedwheelpodcast at gmail.com. Send, e send us an email. But for now, this episode is proudly brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Patreon.com slash wingedwheelpodcast if you want to join the Dub Dub Club. Support the show. It, it really is the heart and soul of everything we do here. Uh, there's a lot of great benefits. Uh, the Discord automatically entered into giveaways you're uh you're given access to our bonus epi episodes that record right after uh more on that later uh additionally detroitredwings.com slash wwp to get your tickets to winged wheel podcast night slash day at the lca they are all sold out as of now but we're working on adding more tickets for you uh that is a partnered event with the detroit red wings where we host a live show of the winged wheel podcast uh featuring special guest ken daniels we have some other uh special surprises for you in store uh for this one, there's a meet and greet with the hosts and the special guests, merch, prizes, giveaways, etc. And, of course, a discounted ticket to uh, the Detroit Red Wings game on Saturday, April 8th against the Pittsburgh Penguins. We all sit in Winged Wheel Podcast uh, seating sections together. Uh, in addition to the discount, a portion of the proceeds from each ticket sold benefits the Jamie Daniels Foundation, which is the reason why we're doing all of this. So DetroitRedWings.com slash WWP. Watch that link. More tickets coming soon. Well... Post trade deadline went as you thought it would for a team that just lost Tyler Bertuzzi, Philip Peronik, Oscar Sunkvist, and you know Verona wasn't really factoring into the lineup, but uh, a team that lost at least three really regular roster players, two of which played in the, the top end of the respective positions. It felt like last year's hockey. It, it, it's all very understandable. Like, I, I didn't watch those games and think, oh my God, this is a travesty. Like, the Red Wings need a massive course correction. This is a room that just got shaken up in a a big way materially on the ice in terms of the roster they could put out. And also, they, they lost two of their, re three of their really close teammates, two of them who had been there for a long, long time in Hronik and Bertuzzi. Yeah, tougher games to watch. A 4-1 loss to the Islanders and the next day a 3-1 loss to Philly. 
Yep. Um, I think the joke I made to you before we started recording is I watched every minute of both games. I don't know if I remember a single thing. <laughs> yeah, really the only thing to note uh, and the Islanders game, those are an Islanders afternoon matinee. Oh, right to bed. It is. They, it's happened twice this year in Long Island, and I'm like, I have so much respect for what the Islanders have done with their team and the success that they've had, but Islanders versus Red Wings is just the easiest way to guarantee that you're going to be snoozing on the couch if you're not really trying. Like, if you're not actively covering the team, I'd be shocked if you weren't asleep. The first goal came at the end, a minute left in the second period. Oh. It, and that was, a, like, that was a mercy that Dylan Larkin gave us that goal. Really great um, pass by Cider from the point, kind of like a shot pass thing, and uh, Fallon Larkin, who made no mistake in front. Um, and then you know, that game ended up 4-1 Islanders because they came out in the third and Detroit didn't. And uh, Detroit's only goal in, against the Flyers was uh, Perron and Kopp connecting really well. And I think Sherratt also factored into that play, so that was a little bit of like a free agents all had a part in this um, uh, kind of play. But yeah, two goals over the weekend, not good for Detroit. But hey, if you are into like the we still have a chance at Connor Bedard kind of thing, wasn't bad on that front. Well, we didn't help ourselves with the Islanders pick. No, no. And you know what? That's a complicated. Like you're It was a win lose either way. Yeah. It, you can see that being beneficial or not beneficial in either direction. The reality is the Islanders are playing for a playoff spot right now and the Red Wings just traded two plus of their best players, so it's not surprising. Wouldn't you know? it be the most Red Wings thing ever to get this pick from the Islanders expecting it to be in the mid-first round, and they will be the team that sneaks into the playoffs by one point and goes on a Cinderella run to the Final Four, and that pick ends up being like 29? They're still in the first wild card spot, and they are in a wild card spot by points percentage too. So it's... Uh, Lovely. You have to really... I am actually pulling for Florida. I really am. Um, Ottawa could make it as well. You shouldn't be really losing to... They're a funny team. They were in a similar position to Detroit. I feel like uh, of the surviving teams, Ottawa is the most like Detroit. Buffalo could still make noise in there. I, I think Washington is on the down, downward trajectory with Detroit. But right now, Detroit still only holds like a 3.5% chance at uh, Connor Bedard. So I have no problem with people who, who will find you know some silver lining from losses. But for me, this isn't like last year or the year before or the year before. The Red Wings just have too much foundation on this roster to be as bad as the Chicago's of the league, to be bad as bad as Columbus, San Jose, Anaheim, Arizona. Like they have them well beat. Like counting from the bottom, these are the lottery standings right now: Columbus, San Jose, Chicago, Anaheim, Arizona, Montreal, Vancouver, Philly, St. Louis, Detroit. So Detroit is tenth from the bottom. I could see them maybe being passed by St. Louis, maybe. I don't know that I'm counting on a strong finish this season from Philadelphia. Yeah, I, I, I could see St. Louis passing them because, you know, they do play in the West, and the West is a little bit more wide open, whereas, as everyone knows, the East, and particularly the Atlantic, is an absolute Thunderdome now. So there's one team. It might be St. Louis to pass them. And St. Louis does have um, a very key home and home towards the end of the month. Uh, against the Detroit Red Wings. So those are two very winnable games for the Blues. <laughs> yeah, watch Detroit sweep those. Well, that would be our punishment for everything we've taken from the Blues roster. Yeah, that's right. So that's the uh, that's what the Red Wings have had, and that's where they are sitting in the standings. Upcoming games, obviously, tonight. By the time you're listening to this, the Chicago game will have been done. And then they have uh, home and home against Boston over the weekend, the 11th and the 12th, both matinee games in the afternoon. Uh, at which point we'll be coming back to you Sunday evening to see where things are at. Uh, home and home against Boston is horrifying. That is one of the best teams in modern NHL history with how they're performing. What do we think? Red Wings are going to walk away uh, a regulation win and an overtime win, probably? I'm going 1-0-1. Oh, and one. Yeah, okay. Uh, some additional Red Wings news. Um, Iserman has been obviously been doing a little bit more media, as he typically does after the trade deadline. He had his uh, press availability right after and also went on uh, 97 won the ticket. Uh, some key takeaways from that um, interview is, you know, stuff that we've heard before and some stuff that we've gleaned before, and we've talked about it a lot on this podcast, but, uh, you know, asked about why he bought in free agency. He, he made a point to say that uh, the Red Wings were already the worst team in the league before, and they got really bad luck in the lottery where they moved down. Obviously, the Red Wings haven't won the lottery. Um, and he didn't want another season where, and we've been talking about this, 
he had to sit up in the press box or sorry, the, the manager's box and watch Detroit get pummeled to the tune of 10 goals. Um, and if they were to really be competitive for Bedard and to compete with the Chicago's and Arizona's of the league who are openly tanking, like very openly tanking, they'd have to sell so many pieces, including, you know, a guy like Larkin. Uh, and then he talked about, you know, if you don't have a competitive team, development of key players like Sider and Raymond could go backwards. Uh, and that's something that we, he's kind of espoused that that value before of really surrounding your key young players with, with solid talent to make sure that they don't go backwards. And honestly, look no further than uh, some other Red Wings prospects that fell off. Like, you know, we really get after Zadina for parts of his game that really fell away uh, when he tried to translate it to the NHL level. But how much of that was uh, affected by the fact that he was playing on some pretty terrible Red Wings teams also? It can't help your confidence when every pass you make doesn't end up in the back of the net. And nine out of ten times when you're sitting open in the slot, the puck's not coming. And, you know, aside from the obvious, and I think none of those things will be surprising to people, he did say something that kind of confirmed what folks, uh, what, you know, we suspect about Hronik when we saw that offer was, okay, if you see that offer for Philip Hronik, you kind of have to pull the trigger. He did say that uh, he would have preferred to have made it in the offseason, but he couldn't guarantee that the deal would be there in the offseason. So he decided to pull the trigger before the deadline. And honestly, to me, that's the right move. Like yeah. if, you, if you're selling Tyler Bertuzzi, you're selling Philip, Her- like you're selling whoever else to get first round picks. And if you have a first round pick and a second on the table, you don't wait to see. Like no. there's no value in having Philip Hronick for 20 something more games in a, in a season. That's already going to be uh, not playoff competitive for the rest of the year. Well, this just confirms that every player on the Red Wings has a price. And um, this was the price for Philip Hronick. So not all that shocked by Steve's response there. And uh, some additional Red Wings news. I think it's important to call this out when it happens because uh, Sebastian Kosa's had a pretty, I think, uh, up and down path to in his development since being drafted by the Red Wings. But uh, as of March 6th, he's had in his last seven starts, which dates back to February 8th with the Toledo, Toledo Walleye in the ECHL, uh, three shutouts. He's tied for the ECHL lead with four on the year. Uh, in those seven games, 7 0 0, 969 save percentage. Nice. And a 0.86 goals against average. It's it's going to be a long road for goaltenders no matter what. Um, someone like Kosa was drafted as a, a more of a project goaltender. They hoped he'd have a higher ceiling but would need more refinement. Um, I don't blame people who had questions about how confident they were in Kosa panning out at any point in this process. But I also think it's if, if we're going to focus or folks are going to focus a lot on the negatives. Or, you know, this has gone wrong for Kosa, or he's not already winning in the AHL like some other of his uh, peers. Let's call out when he's doing well. And he really is thriving on a very competitive walleye team right now. Yeah, and a goalie with his talent is always going to have these streaks. That just comes with having the talent. Um, We've seen him have streaks like this in the opposite direction before, but he's doing this at the highest level he's done this at. You know, every other run he's had like this has been in junior. So it's good to see him finally piece it all together. Um, You know, what his path forward is from here for the rest of the season is probably just more Toledo. And hopefully he gets a couple streaks like this in Grand Rapids next year. You know, it's not streaks like this in a level like the ECHL are good. And I'm and not taking away from the stats of it all. Mm -hmm. But the important takeaway here is consistency. Yeah, it isn't that he's putting up a 0.86 GAA. It isn't that he's putting up a 9.69 save percentage. Although that is great, it's that he's done it for seven games in a row. There hasn't been these ups and these downs and these highs and these lows. He has just been consistently good throughout the streak. With and for a goalie specifically that was coming in with the resume that Sebastian Costa did, where you know all the athletic ability, all the raw tools, hasn't really you know put it all together yet some inconsistency, some technical flaws, this is what we need to see. Just, again, if this stat line was 4-2-1 and one, and you take the shutouts away, but the save percentage stays the same or pretty close to it, just as good. Because mm-hmm. that's that's what the Red Wings need to see right now. All right. That's some Red Wings news. Uh, again, we'll see on Sunday where they're, uh, whether we're going to have some more interesting conversations about the standings and the draft lottery. But for now, let's talk uh, a little bit more about, you know, the very still big storylines uh, coming out of the trade deadline and what the reaction is from folks who have a little bit more of a national focus. And that's why we brought in 
uh, the ever talented Shana Goldman from The Athletic, as well as the Too Many Men podcast. Uh, Shana, aside from breaking a ton of the trades that happened across the NHL, had some uh, uh, really good analysis on the Red Wings trade specifically. I know she was one of the ones who, uh, when the Philip Hronick deal went down, Shana had uh, some analysis out there pretty quickly uh, where she kind of broke down why this was a big win for the Red Wings and why it didn't quite make sense for the Vancouver Canucks. So I wanted to know more. Uh, we wanted to know more, and it's uh, it's a matter of time. It was only a matter of time before we could convince uh, Shana to come on the show. So hope you enjoyed this interview where we talk trade deadline, we talk analytics and the eye test, and uh, some stories from across the league. So without further ado, enjoy this interview with Shana Goldman. Shana, I was going to start your introduction with, like, you know, the, the proper introduction, but I realized that we now... Uh, have had the entire trio of the Too Many Men podcast on our show. So this is a like a crowning achievement for us. <laughs> That's amazing. I like I'm glad I can follow in their footsteps. They're both two MVPs. You you should absolutely bring this back to them and brag and say you had to save the best for last and that's why, you know, you <laughs> held out. Uh, there we go. Folks, we're, we are joined by uh, Shana Goldman. Shana is a writer for The Athletic and, of course, one of the uh, three wonderful hosts of the Too Many Men podcast. Shana, how are you after a crazy, crazy trade deadline week? I'm good. Um, I feel a little bit refreshed. Uh, I definitely am going to take a quick second to fully refresh before the playoffs, but um, I had fun with it. I think that this is the way it should be moving forward. No more one day, a couple hours of like chaos. We didn't, we get to digest the trades if we get this week. I just want a little warning next time around that this is what we're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, it's not a new phenomenon. You've broken news in the past and I, I like the uh, chorus of Shane a bomb, Shane a bomb, whatever <laughs> you do it. But you were really among the leading, if not one of the leading um, folks in media who was breaking news left and right, more so than, you know, most, if not all of the uh, most inside hockey insiders that people would have uh, thought to look to. So what was that like for you uh, with, you know, the news coming through your Twitter account and uh, you putting it out there in the world? Very weird. Um, yeah. It's not my job to report. Um, I like doing analysis. I consider myself an analyst and that is what I want to be. I don't want to be some newsbreaker, but sometimes like things fall in your lap and I think it's fun to kind of disrupt it a little bit. Like, Hockey insidering is so different from the other major sports, and I don't know, I think it's fun to to shake things up a little bit. I don't think people would have expected it to be coming from me, and it's like, I'm with all of you. <laughs> so I think it added a fun twist to things, a little surprise, like, oh, not just you're waiting for trades, but now you're getting them from an unlikely source. Um, but, you know, it, it was fun, and everyone was really, for the most part, super nice and supportive, which I appreciate. Yeah, definitely. And I have to say, if folks aren't following Shana on Twitter, it's at Hey Shay, which uh, three Y's on both <laughs> words. Um, uh, an excellent follow for her analysis and now kind of uh, does it all with with breaking trades as well. Yeah, now everyone's going to be disappointed, though. They're like, <laughs> it's like back to the regular schedule content of video and numbers. Get, <laughs> giddy up, everyone. Get ready. Just do what everyone else does. Just make it up. <laughs> Uh, speaking of surprises, Shana, we let's lead off with the trade that I think took Red Wings fans a little bit uh, off guard, which was the Philip Ron trade to Vancouver. And uh, the reason I want to lead with that one is because you had some pretty pointed words uh, about that in your analysis that you published on The Athletic, which we'll uh, link to in the description of this episode. Walk us through how, you know, you reacted to that trade as it came out and what your take is, uh, you know, in grade wise in terms of how Vancouver did and how Detroit did. Yeah, um, it completely shocked me. I think it shocked everyone. It was a trade we really didn't see coming. We saw so many names out there and that wasn't one of them. The thing with it was Vancouver had their hands in so many different things and so many general managers do. I can't just say it's the Canucks. I feel like everyone needs to keep that in mind. Like when there's interest in a player, there's the kicking the tires, there's the actual pursuing, and then there's going out and getting them. Like there's so many different levels of it and every general manager should have conversations with every general manager about any potential deal. So while we might feel this one came out of left field, there's for every trade that happens, there's a million more that don't happen. And everyone was expecting something big from Vancouver, and rightfully so, because they did have conversations with teams about top forwards and, you know, moving forwards with term out. And then we see them bring in a defenseman. From the Canucks perspective, getting a right-handed defenseman is what they've needed for some time. That defense was flawed when they entered the season, and it's only gotten worse. Um, so it it made sense for them to to acquire someone. But when you consider the cap, considerations and the fact that this is a player going through a career year who 
you know, you're selling high and you're buying high, it's going to cost you in the long run. And that long runs a year and a half. That's going to be a problem for a team that's already over the cap. If the Canucks were a contender right now and needed a couple pieces to shore up their defense, this would be a great move. If this was a team that was kind of just entering their window of contention, kind of what Detroit could have been this year had things gone a little bit differently, it would have made sense for them. It doesn't though, for where they are, for what they need to do. So I have a ton of questions for Vancouver on what they were thinking. I don't know if they have the answers because I sure don't. But from the Red Wings perspective, who could have seen that coming? You anticipated pending UFAs to be moved out if things went south, which obviously they did in a very painful way. Um, and I feel for every Red Wings fan because I've had so much fun tracking this team the last few weeks. They were supposed to lead off my column about the vibe check. And then that came off the heels of the two Senators games that I had to outright change what I was doing. So I was, I was a little bummed. I've been wait, I was waiting, you know, for a couple weeks to write about them. Uh, but the thing is, it felt like an opportunity for them to maximize the return, sell high, get get what they can back, especially if they don't want to deal with the cap implications of his next contract. Obviously, it leads a big void, and it did feel like for a couple minutes there, maybe there was something that was going to come to follow for Detroit. Obviously, there wasn't. But, you know, I would still be curious on what they do moving forward. I think I know the deal you're talking about, which was, you know, Chicken ended up going to Ottawa, which was one of the moves people uh, were speculating about. We'll get there. Um, I want to now get your take on uh, the other kind of major trade of the four that the Red Wings made around the deadline, which was, you know, the Tyler Bertuzzi saga finally ended um, with, you know, Steve Eisenman supposedly taking him off the market. We don't know whether that was, you know, a, a faux signal to other GMs or whether he actually had a change of heart after the Ottawa games. No matter what it was, it resulted in him being moved to Boston, obviously 50% retained on the expiring contract in exchange for the conditional 2024 20, fourth. Or sorry, 2024 first that will move to 2025 if it's uh, top 10. Um, and then the 2025 fourth round pick. Yeah. Um, the Bertuzzi trade is interesting because it makes all... The, it's If you're Detroit, you don't have to move out your pending free agents, even though everything went south. They're not a team like... I keep using the Islanders as the example, but they're the ones that stand out to me. It's so different when you're at a different point in your timeline that they didn't, they could, they've recouped assets. They have the cap space. They have prospects. They have draft picks. They have everything they could want that they could say, we don't need to recoup any extra assets here. And we could just roll with it moving forward. In a lot of other situations, you can't afford to do that. Detroit can. So it's completely and totally different. But the fact is it's, you would have to assume they didn't see a future there. They didn't want to go through another negotiation. And when they felt things going south, you have to move them. And like you said, it could have been posturing to other general managers. Of course it could have. Why would we move out our player? If you want him, you're going to have to convince us and spice it up a little bit more. So if that was the case, that was good management. That's good asset management right there. And if anyone can do it, we all know it's Steve Eiserman. We've all seen what he can do as a general manager. So um, while it, it, you know, it's disappointing because it definitely signaled that there wasn't the faith in this team to contend, rightfully so. If things, you know, everything is, the margins are super thin and they're not completely out of it right now, but you look at it, you have Buffalo, you have Ottawa coming up the ranks, you have the Islanders somehow staying in it because they got so lucky everyone else was losing, um, that they have to do what's right for them. So if that wasn't a player they were going to keep around or they kind of already knew it, it makes all the sense in the world to move him out and get what you can back. And that's going to be a high return because he's the kind of player teams love for the playoffs. He's hard nosed. He has offensive upside. He's a legitimately good player with that physicality. And he's thrived in post seasons in the past before he was at the NHL level. So why not, you know, capitalize off that? So uh, something that I've kind of been really interested to see is uh, other folks' assessment of the Red Wings trade deadline, especially folks with a more national focus, not those necessarily in the weeds like we are on Detroit day in and day out. Um, and I find that there's sometimes a conflation between the trade deadline grade and the rebuild grade. And I find those are two very different scenarios. So if you'll bear with me and kind of isolate those two things, how would you grade the Red Wings trade deadline? And then what are your thoughts or even a potential grade on, you know, the rebuild or the eyes are plan, so to speak, to date? I will give their deadline a B plus. It's hard. They ripped off a Band-Aid, but they signed Dylan Larkin, who I really think is a good... Is he an elite 1C, in my opinion? No. But is he a very high-end 1C? Yes. And, like, he's been through all the bad years in Detroit that now you get to see him on a team that's, like, up and coming. I think that's good. That's a good foundational piece to have. Um, the Bertuzzi trade, I feel like, had to happen once they knew... what One, what the return was going to be, two, you know, 
where they were headed. Um, and for Philip Peronic, it was, it was so surprising, but it makes a lot of sense. I think I'm waiting. We have to grade trades as they happen. And obviously I did. I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop there though, to get a better picture of, you know, what's going to happen on defense. So I'll, I will give their deadline a B plus. Um, it was harsh. It was unfortunate, but I think, sorry, it'll be better. Um, in, in, in the long run, which is what this all is about. For the rebuild, I feel like some people are afraid to criticize it because everybody knows what Steve Eiserman can do. And it's like, we can't criticize Steve Eiserman and he has a plan. I think that's true that he has a plan. I think he's still open for criticism. I'm going to give him right now. I'm between like a B and a B plus. I wish I could give him like a B point five. That's like almost a B plus <laughs> because. I do think that there's been a lot of good. We see the players that they've brought up through the draft. We see Lucas Raymond and Mo Sider, and now you're pairing that with Larkin. No, I'm I'm gonna make it a B plus. You know what? I really like the Billy Huso deal. I think that Nadalkovich was a total miss, and that was someone I think it was really tricky because I didn't have a lot. I was a little more skeptical of him because he was a late riser, and there wasn't that much NHL foundation, and it wasn't that long before that that he was struggling at the AHL level too. But I really like the Huso contract, and I like the low-risk nature of it. Um, I like, you know, the way that they address their blue line. Do I like the Ben Chirot deal? No. Does anybody? Probably not. But I think that around that, you know, Olimata, I think, was a good ad. And I think that they, they saw what to address, and now they have another thing to address. They get, you know, poor marks for the Verona situation. That, that trade obviously hasn't worked out great for either side. Um but if they can now swing for some big forwards, because that's what it feels like they need to go along with the players that they're, you know, bringing up the ranks, that's where my head goes. I think that they have a really good shutdown center and suitor. I think that they have, you know, pieces like Raymond and Rasmussen, like it's getting there. But I just need a little bit more to to bump the grade up. And I could look like an idiot in two years and it's like he had a plan all along. But it felt like last summer it was the summer of defense. Like I need to see the summer of offense now. All right. Well, the uh, that's going to be an ongoing conversation, and we've kind of touched on some more of the interesting storylines that happened around the trade deadline. So uh, let's jump over to Jacob Chikrin. Uh, there was, you know, that moment of uh, Red Wings fans wondering if there's going to be some closure, some hockey poetry, where Chikrin ended up going to Arizona originally as part of Arizona taking Datsuk's contract years back. The pick Detroit used from Arizona, they drafted Hronik with. The pick Arizona used, they drafted Chikrin, so on and so forth. Uh, obviously, Chikrin ended up going to Ottawa, and there have been some questions from myself, candidly, uh, about the return. You know, Chikrin had been held uh, back from being traded for so long, uh, and the return was a little bit, in my opinion, underwhelming. And there have been some questions about how much of it had to do with the amount of money involved that Arizona would have to pay. What do you make of that trade? Uh, are folks being too harsh on Arizona? And uh, how you know surprised were you that Ottawa was the team he ended up going to? I don't think people are being hard enough on Arizona. I am someone that has tried to be very nice about the Coyotes for a bit because I feel really terrible for their fans at how poorly run the franchise is. But I think what they did at the deadline this year was awful. I think the way they went about cap circumvention, essentially, to bring in these cap hits and bring in injured players that we get covered by insurance so they don't have to actually spend is so wrong. And it's a situation that's even more disappointing for a team that the league has done so much to try to prop up and support and keep things afloat. And this is how you respond. And I understand this management team hasn't been there for so long. And it's not like they were dealt a great hand, but they have done a horrible job managing it. And to pinch pennies the way they have, it's it's completely wrong. So I think that that team needs help from top to bottom. Um, they really could have leaned into this Yes, we have a bad situation, but we're going to make some, make the best out of it, make some fun with it. And I just think they've gone the complete opposite. So I'm hoping that we see more players get freed from there because you don't want to see Nick Schmaltz and Clayton Keller rot away. Um, yes, I can say without a doubt, the return would have been better if they were willing to take on salary that there, there were other deals out there and they chose against it because they didn't, you know, like it, with the Kings, it was rumored that they didn't want to take salary back. Uh, there, there were definitely other suitors that wanted him, and rightfully so, because Chikrin is such a good player. I don't think people 
um, fully recognize it if they don't dig deep below the surface and they're either blinded by the goal totals or have some like misconception about his defense and don't look at the context of his game. And even in a team on a team like Arizona that was so bad, he still was really good. So the return for me, absolutely positively underwhelming. I think it's great for him to go to the Senators, though, because the Senators are a team that I think rewarded, has rewarded management with the way that they've been fighting back despite some tough injuries and things like that to manage this year. So I I give them credit for going for it. I think it's such a great fit. They needed somebody, and it felt like it could they could have easily fallen into like the trap of going for a Pareko, thinking you need that steady defense and that kind of presence, which I don't think is what this team was missing. I think uh, Mackenzie Weger could have been a good ad, but I think this is, you know, the best option available for sure. So next up, I will say Shana's choice. Um, I'll lead off with, you know, Tanner Janot was one of the uh, the big trades that I think reset the market for a lot of teams. I, I think Steve Eisman can count himself lucky that that trade happened because it probably inflated prices uh, for guys like Tyler Bertuzzi. Uh, what deals, if it's the Janot one, if it's other trades, what storylines, what teams made uh, moves that you felt were notable, either positively or otherwise, uh, that you feel like really defined this trade deadline as uh, one of the more intriguing ones in recent history? So it's so interesting. I would say who got overpaid for and who got underpaid for is the story for me. And Chikram, we talk about the underpaid and it's the Timo Myers that get the underpayment. Um, I would have wanted a lot back if I were the Sharks. And I can't believe there weren't better offers. Um, I really thought a team like Detroit or St. Louis was going to try to spice that up. And it, I don't know if there was like a tax on certain teams for being the Western Conference. I would imagine with Vegas, if, you know, San Jose had the prospect of going up against them for years, they would want to up the price. But what they did, in my opinion, was incredibly disappointing. Um, from a chaos standpoint, it was, I think he's a great fit in New Jersey. I think the Devils are going to be a blast to watch, even more fun than they've already been. But, you know, from a chaos standpoint, is it fun when the player goes to the expected destination? Like, if Chick Ryan went to L.A., would we have had as much fun? I don't know, unless maybe the payment was really up there. But then you have, on the flip side, the players who, uh, you know, are getting the overpayments. It's the Tanner Janos. I think Tanner Janos is going to be a fantastic fit with the Lightning. I think everybody's going to forget about that price of acquisition when he's out there with big hits and offensive spark from, you know, the middle six in the playoffs. No one's going to think twice when he's out there making the Maple Leafs look ridiculous. Nobody is going to care about the cost of acquisition. But first, the Lightning need to get there. And I wonder if they overcommitted some of their assets in this single deal when I, if I were them, I probably would have gone for defensive depth. And I'm saying that before the Hedman injury. Now it's even more so. It kind of proves that they could have used it. I think that if you're a contending team like the Lightning, you know, Breezewell was talking about when you can and can't spend first round picks. He was spot on. He was absolutely positively right. If you're a contender, you absolutely spend those picks because those picks aren't going to help you when you need it. Those picks, they're, they're not going to bring in a player anytime soon. And if you're a contender, it's going to be a late pick, which is essentially the value of a second rounder. So I understand that from that perspective, but to bunch up the assets the way he did and also pick you use picks that are so far out that lightning team might not be great in two or three years those picks are going to be all the more valuable to other acquiring teams that they're going to take the opportunity thinking well if we think the lightning aren't going to be as good because their core is going to age it's going to look bad like it's going to look bad for them that pick's going to be great for us of course we'll take them up on that opportunity so i just think they have to really keep an eye on their timeline and i just think that this was poor asset management even though the thought process behind it was right it just wasn't for the right return Okay. And, you know, we're talking about picks uh, plenty. I, I want to kind of come back to Detroit here uh, and just, you know, back to the rebuild. The Red Wings over the next two drafts have four first round picks. Obviously, the Islanders and the Boston picks um, both have uh, uh, conditions attached. They also have four second round picks, three of them being this season. That's quite a bit of draft capital. And, you know, we're now getting into a, a version of these Red Wings that have sniffed important games down the, the line. The playoffs didn't seem crazy for, you know, a, a cumulative two to three months this season. Um, and Steve Eisenman has talked very candidly and openly about the business benefit to getting playoff games in the LCA, giving Hockey Town fans, you know, a playoff series for the first time in, you know, seven-ish years. Uh, what is your take on, you know, the a likely outcome in terms of what it's done with these picks versus what you would do uh, with these picks? And, and by that, I mean, do you make the picks? 
do you uh, consolidate the picks to try to move up in a strong 2023 draft, or are you going to try the, to move him for players? And I know he's off the board now, but for you know a Timo Meyer type. Yeah, um, I think we're going to see a mix of it. I don't think there's going to be an overcommitment one way or the other. I feel like there's going to be a measured approach of moving out a number of picks to bring back players and also using some of the picks. Maybe even, you know, you could take, let's say, a first round pick and get two seconds out of it, something like that. You know, the value of a draft pick varies who you ask, but I think that there are database approaches that show like what it should actually be worth at this point. So I think that there's ways to do it where you can still keep some of the picks for yourself and keep adding to your prospect pool because it is, you know, it's never bad to have a good pipeline because even if you don't use those players, you can flip them at a later date if you develop them right. And I think under Iserman, if we look at the strengths of Tampa Bay, it really isn't their drafting. It's it's finding players outside the draft. It's finding players in late round and taking swings on skill and developing it above all else. You know, Braden Point, here's a flawed player who had poor skating. Here's a skating coach. We're going to help maximize your game. Tyler Johnson, you look at the developmental path and how that helped him. So if the Red Wings feel confident in their development path, they can feel pretty confident in, you know, moving some picks, picking in late rounds, and looking outside the draft entirely. I would be very surprised if they use every single one of those draft picks and don't make a move because at a certain point... Most general managers in rebuild tell you they don't want all 18 and 19 year old players. They want 23 year olds, 24 year olds, 25 year olds. So if you didn't spend all that time developing them yourself, and they have been, you know, you're going to look outside. You're going to look to other teams like an Alex Dubrincat type deal. So, you know, the biggest problem is are those caliber players available? That isn't always the case. The best way to get elite talent is to draft it and develop it yourself. But if you can't, there are ways to be creative. And if you have the assets, you have the cap space, you have the flexibility, which the Red Wings do, there are ways to to find it. Okay, Shana, we only have so much time with you. So I want to jump over to something that uh, I've actually wanted to talk uh, to you about for a long time, which is that, you know, you mentioned you're an analyst for The Athletic and you do have a uh, focus on you know the Rangers, the Devils, fantasy hockey as well, which has been very useful for me. Um, but you have a very national focus, and I think you do uh, a really great job of combining you know the data that you've talked about and those analytics. You mesh it with uh, what people call the eye test, and I think that's a little bit reductive. You you provide the video as well, and you kind of marry those two things together and create a package product which does away in this in my mind it does away with this whole. Um, antagonistic eye test versus analytics approach and, and gets people thinking about the game in a more in-depth way. How has that, you know, uh, been for you in terms of bringing that more to the forefront through uh, your work with The Athletic? And, uh, you know, what's your opinion on, you know, analytics versus eye test uh, or any of those kinds of uh, dynamics? Yeah, I don't think there's a perfect way to watch and analyze hockey. I think we all do it with our own twist. But I think that if there's information out there, you should use it. You know, it's as simple as that. You're not watching a game, calculating in your brain how many zone entries there are. You're not watching the power play going. You might notice it, but you don't. You you don't have it factually in your hands. Going, well, you know, they attempted to enter the zone on the right side. You know, they went for the drop pass and then streaked up the right side of the ice. And every time they did that, they failed to enter the zone. But they're having, you know, 75% of the time, if they go on the left side, they're do- they're doing a much better tar- job targeting that. Your brain is not computing that. But if you can have something to back it up, it's great. And when you have that something to back it up, you don't have to stop there. You can go back and now rewatch the tape. I think rewatching video is the most useful thing. When I'm working on a story, I watch so much tape. I went through, and oh my God, the money I would pay for a good video service. Um, I went through Evolving Hockey last night with the play-by-play sheets uh, and searched up goals against Ryan O'Reilly was on the ice for because I wanted to know, is he contributing to those goals against? Because I really wasn't sure. When you look at the numbers, you know, on the surface, you're like, this looks bad. And it's not just bad because the team's bad. It's bad relative to his teammates. It's bad relative to his other years when you, you know, factor in that context. So you turn to the tape. It's 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 what you can do because if I were to avoid the video right there, I wouldn't have had an answer. It would have been me making something up. And listen, I can make stuff up all day too, but that's not going to help anyone. And it's not going to help me. It's not going to make me better at my job and understand the player. And it's not going to help the reader learn anything if I just lie and make something up. So I am someone that is just very big on having factual evidence to back it up. I think that 
there should never be a disagreement between eye test and numbers. I think that at times there are players who are going to be analytics darlings, but if you can look at the right context, you can figure that out. If you see a player might have the most incredible numbers in the world, but they have the softest minutes on one of the best teams, you have to take that in stride. And yes, it might help to watch the video to figure it out, but like it should never be one or the other. And sometimes it gets pinned against each other that way for absolutely no reason at all. So it's just reductive at this point. So with your in-depth understanding of the world of analytics, is there anything that you see used publicly either by, you know, other analysts or, you know, fans at large, um, you know, a specific stat or, or uh, an application of analytics that just makes you want to pull your hair out? Yes, there are. <laughs> there are Can you give there. Us, what's the one where like what jumped to your mind when I was talking about that? Um, there are just sometimes I see things that I feel like lack context. And that is it for me. Like, I think that single numbers, wins above replacement, goals above replacement, game score value added are wonderful. They're a jumping off point and only a jumping off point. And the model makers will tell you as such. Sometimes I feel like they're thrown out there without context. And that is what drives me up a wall. I think that context is the most important thing in the world because you can't simply say this player has a value of X and this player has a value of Y. Therefore, one is better than the other. If you're saying their usage is identical, their roles are identical, their quality of competition is identical, their quality of teammates is identical, the systems and strategies are identical, and somehow that's the conversation. Okay, sure. Go ahead, Ted, with your numbers. Go ahead. But 99% of the time, that's not the case. I would say more so than that. Even if you're talking about players on the same team saying, who should play, you know, take the Red Wings? Who should play with Ben Sherrod? Who can manage those, withstand those minutes better? Was it Cider or was it Philip Ronick? You're still going to need to build context. You can't simply say, well, together they have this number and together they have that number. Well, something else has changed. If he's playing with Mo Cider, he's going up against top competition. If he's up with Philip Ronick, he's not. There's a difference right there. And you need that context to fully build out the situation. And sometimes we don't have the time and the effort and anything else or the characters on Twitter to break down every aspect of the context. But I think that there's ways to present information that it's not the end all be all without it. And that is something that absolutely drives me up a wall. Well, folks, if you were listening to that very uh, a well thought out detailed explanation and you were worried that you might not be able to kind of suss out those details, I will tell you a great way to learn a little bit more about it would be uh, to use your subscription to The Athletic and read Shana's work there. Uh, also tune in to the Too Many Men podcast with uh, Sarah Sivian and Allison Lucan. And uh, Shana, I neglected to say that you're the co-creator of BehindTheBenches.com as well. So there's a lot of great places where they can find your work. Thank you so, so much for joining us on the Winged Wheel podcast. And let's do this again sometime. Thanks for having me. And that was our interview with Shana Goldman. Uh, again, really, really great uh, analysis. Good to kind of hear someone, a, a different perspective on, you know, a trade deadline grade uh, versus a rebuild grade. And that conversation is not over just because the trade deadline is. We have some more uh, content coming up. We have uh, uh, some really great guests. We're going to have a roundtable coming up where, you know, we start to really dig into those questions of, yeah, how was this trade deadline, but what's really happened over the last year? And, you know, how would you grade the rebuild? And, and more importantly, what direction has it taken? Because it can be confusing to to kind of track at times. So uh, more on that to come. Uh, a quick note here before we get into the prospect profile. There's This isn't news, but I just kind of want to acknowledge it. You know, the, the whole Verona saga was, a, I know, a, a complicated one. Uh, to understand and frankly to report on. It was a very delicate situation, but I just want to uh, call out uh, Doug Armstrong's comments on acquiring Verona uh, for the St. Louis Blues. He said things like, uh, it was a good ad for us. He got traded to Detroit and had some off-ice issues that he's not running from and we're not running from. He's looking forward to a fresh start uh, to his career and we're looking forward to giving him that. He uh, he said they did their due diligence on Verona and they said uh, they saw no reason to not give him another opportunity. Uh, quote, we did our research and you understand the risks, but there's probably a lot of players that have those risks and we don't even uh, know have them. I don't want to get too much into it because I don't know the exact things, but I'm a big believer in second chances. And, you know, this isn't a dig at the Red Wings or Verona or anyone else, but in a situation where it's very clear that that relationship had worn through and that was, you know, com you could see that coming from pretty much a mile away, uh, that this, this was going to be the end result. It's nice. I'm I'm just happy to see that, uh, the next step for Verona is this kind of opportunity where a team wants to make the most uh, out of it for, I mean, obviously selfish reasons. They think they have a potential, you know, 40 goal scorer under there. 
Uh, but it, it's what Verona would want right now. So that was uh, that was good to hear. All right. Uh, like I promised at the top of the show, it is prospect profile season once again. And uh, we're going to start one off. We're not going to, we started off with Connor Bedard. And I think this time in our little reboot, let's start off with one a little bit more realistic. That will probably be in and around Detroit's range uh, of where they're drafting if things fall as they do now. So uh, out of Owen Sound in the OHL, let's talk about Colby Barlow. Brad, kick us off. Everybody's going to have debates about where Colby Barlow will and should go in the first round. And obviously that's just an evaluation on level of talent. But the thing that makes Colby Barlow interesting to me specifically as someone who's invested in the Red Wings is he is everything the Red Wings are missing. He is a gifted, gifted goal scorer who plays in the dirty areas and has a wicked shot. I don't know if there's a single player on the Red Wings who even come close to matching his profile. Again, he's he may or may not pan out in the NHL. That's the way prospects work. But he's one of the top goal scorers in the CHL this year. Uh, if you've ever seen a picture or video of him, he looks like he's 35 already, <laughs> uh, which helps in terms of, you know, looking the part. Um, uh, and not to, not to, you know, pigeonhole the guy. He's got... Good hockey sense. He can move the puck. Uh, He's not a great skater. He's super strong on the puck, uh, super smart, but he always, he's a shoot first option. Mm -hmm. He makes his good passes after he's already determined the shot isn't there. Um, And again, that's a a very good thing the Red Wings do not have right now on their roster. If you dropped Colby Barlow on the Detroit Red Wings for the game against the Hawks tonight, he probably has the best shot on the Red Wings tonight. Genuinely, genuinely. <laughs> that, well, that's first, not that's that, Pusuter erasure. But go ahead. Yeah. You know, not not um, as much as I'd love to be that that stat be a hundred percent about uh, Colby Barlow. That's also a, an indicative of the Red Wings currently. Yep. <laughs> if you think of um, uh, not to compare players, but in terms of the player profile and and what you're hoping to get out of a guy and what role he fills on a team. Look at what Mason McTavish is in Anaheim. That's the role you hope Colby Barlow can fill in on the Red Wings. He can play on your power play. Uh, he can anchor your middle six if everything goes well. Um, he's never going to, you know, be a burner, but, you know, he can be effective in the small areas. He can be effective in the shooting areas. He can be effective along the boards. And, and again, relative to the talent, he's probably going somewhere between, I would guess, pick six and 15 in this draft yeah that seems appropriate which is the red wings are going to have at least one pick in that range so they should be looking long and hard at him i really like the way tony ferrari um, friend of the show he does a lot of good work for the hockey news as well he described him as a a meat and potatoes player and and you see you watch his game and like you said brad he's not afraid to get into the dirty areas you know described as a garbage man of sorts to be able to do that as well as use like a wicked shot to score that that's the kind of thing that does genuinely translate into production um, more reliably than not, I think, at the NHL level. Uh, I used to think, I used to kind of pigeonhole players like that as, you know, not productive or maybe don't have high-end talent. And I've been burned before because I've been wrong about those guys. I do think there might be something to say about true uh, high-end or like what's the, the ultimate ceiling there where I don't know if I'd go for Barlow over some of his peers in that range. I also wonder about Barlow's physical maturity, right? Like how much of what he can do is because he's already big compared to his peers. Well, he's already been divorced twice and has three kids. He's got that dad strength. (laughs) Yeah, he's got that Shane Wright look, right? (laughs) So those are, and those aren't knocks, but those are, I think, risks with someone of this player player type. Uh, You did a good job of outlining what he does really well. and, And you also noted his skating, Brad, which I think is important. But if you look at positionally, this is a left shot winger who... Um, is already physically mature. And is that who you would want necessarily the Red Wings to swing on with pick 10, for example? I, again, it depends on how the draft board falls, but yes, he's going to be probably very high on my list in terms of the range the Wings are picking. You know, again, if if player X, Y, or Z falls, then that changes everything. But if the Red Wings are picking 10 and I have Barlow ranked between 8 and 12, yeah, he's he's got to be high up the list. And we're at the point in the rebuild 
and we say best player available every year, and that's always going to hold true. But if there's even like the slightest of differences between Barlow and the players around him when the Red Wings are picking, I think Barlow has to be the choice just because of the the role he would fill on the Red Wings and how severely they lack in this department. It's not even in this department now. The only prospect in the entire system who even is close to the the uh, role that Barlow would fill is Carter Mazur, and he's a righty. So, you know, we obviously hate him now, but look at what Brady Kachuk did to the Red Wings last week. Yeah. You can be slow. You can be a poor skater in the NHL and still be super effective if you're smart. Let's hope for you yet, Evan. Yeah. yeah, that's right. If you're smart, willing to engage in the physical game, and when you have the puck on your stick, you can make plays. And those are literally his three main strengths. The thing that we have noticed over the last, I'm going to call it 10 to 15 years in the draft, that it's going to sound so stupid to say, but it gets overlooked, but there's example after example, is teams not valuing high enough the guys who can score, that, that can just simply put the puck in the net. Yeah. You go all the way back to 2010 and Jeff Skinner. He put up a 50-goal season in Kitchener, and he still fell to, like, pick seven or eight. And all of a sudden, he's here we are 15 years later, still putting up 30 goals in the NHL, despite his wonky draft profile at the time. Cole Caulfield, look how far he fell. Tarasenko was in the mid-teens. Like, Debrinkit. Debrinkit went to the second round. It happens over and over and over again. And, you know, yeah, you look at Barlow. He's not that quick. He doesn't have the flashiest hands. A lot of his goals are not going to end up on the highlight reel because it's generally just a catch and release shot, or like, like you said, he's a garbage man. Get, uh, get some garbage goals in front of the net. But dude's already got forty this year. So there's only been five players since the turn of the millennium that have scored fifty goals as an under eighteen in in the OHL. John Tavares, Alex DeBrincat, Steven Stamkos, Arthur Kaliev, and Jeff Skinner. Every one of them is translated to the NHL in some degree. Kaliev, you know, didn't turn out like the rest of them, but he's there and he's yeah. a regular and he's contributing. And Barlow, I think, is on pace for 52 right now. And it's worth mentioning because in junior hockey, context is everything. How many guys have you seen put up 120 points in junior and amount to nothing? Owen Sound is not a wagon. Mm -hmm. They are a very middle-of-the-road, mediocre OHL team. Barlow, I'm pretty sure, is their captain. He was their captain at 17. Yeah, so not only is he putting up these impressive numbers, he is the driver in Owen Sound. He is, I've, he, they play in the same division as Kitchener, so we've seen enough of him uh, directly. He is the driver on that team. He is not a passenger. He is not racking up a lot of freebie points. His line mates might be because of him, mm -hmm. but yeah. So his his numbers are legit numbers. They're not quote unquote junior hockey numbers. Aside from filling a, a heavy need in Detroit, which is scoring, I also you know want to kind of package up a lot of what you both have said about his game. He plays a Steve Eisman type game. You know, you talked about Brady Kachuk, and and Eisman just watched Brady Kachuk dump all over Detroit's. Pretty much almost single. Like, if you had to point to one player who ended Detroit's playoff hopes, it's dramatic to say, and it didn't actually shake out this way, but you can reasonably say Brady Kachuk ended Detroit's playoff hopes. Barlow plays a complete game with that physicality, like you mentioned, Brad, with that kind of the hard-nosed style. He, he's, he plays on both special teams. Uh, he gets into the dirty areas. He is known for his effort, his grind, his compete. That is a Steve Eisenman-type player. Now, I also want to acknowledge, you're going to hear us say that a lot. If this is your first time uh, uh, following us around a draft year or a draft um, profiles and leading up to the NHL draft, a Steve Eisman type player, is a it's, a it's a wide net to cast. And generally, if you're talking about the top half of a draft, which we have been ever since the start of this podcast, because hmm. that's generally where the Red Wings have been drafting, uh, those players are going to be very good. So a lot of them are going to fit the mold. But Barlow really does fit that mold in, in a good way. So... That's our quick prospect profile on Colby Barlow. Uh, I wonder how much of a riser he's going to be and whether you know he's going to price himself out of Detroit's range, so to speak. This is one of those circumstances where when we talk about, is a draft good? Is a draft actually that deep? And you know, some people say, yeah, this draft is really deep. It goes all the way into the 20s of uh, like high-quality prospects. Other people are going, it's just because the top four is so strong. Where the Red Wings are... Picking either one of those will work in the Red Wings' favor because even if you 
take out the top four and you go, okay, this is an average draft. Well, those top four push a player like Col- Colby Barlow four spots back. So if the Red Wings are picking nine and this guy's a top five pick in any other draft, he might make it to nine because those four guys might bump him from five to nine. And, you know, I, I'm we're using him as the example. We can make this argument with yeah five, six, seven other players in this draft, but he is very much in that group. Okay. That's our prospect profile. More of those to come as we uh, trudge towards the NHL draft. And it's a nice way to kind of temper maybe the last, you know, uh, 20 or 19 or so games for the Red Wings, which won't be as fun as the first 60 odd games. Uh, the prospect profiles give you something to look forward to as a Red Wings fan. And if there's ever a year to be in the mushy middle, which I, I hate that place for the Red Wings in general, it's a year where there's a deep draft like Brad just mentioned. Okay, this is one that I wasn't expecting. One last topic before overtime here. Uh, there have been some, and I, I want to really emphasize rumors. Like there has not been a lot of concrete evidence to back these, except uh, a few very prevalent and reliable folks, one of them being Kevin Weeks, um, has mentioned that, you know, teams like Atlanta and Houston, or sorry, cities like Atlanta and Houston are getting some buzz around potential expansion for the NHL. Now, I don't doubt that Atlanta and Houston have wealthy billionaire owners or conglomerates that want to, you know, poke the NHL about expansion. Uh, Gary Bettman, I believe, has been on record pretty recently to say that the NHL is not in expansion mode right now, having just completed expansion of 32 teams. Uh, But I'm a pretty big where there's smoke, there's fire person, and there must be at least something happening here. It could be that those owners are are causing the buzz themselves, like you you leak certain things to media to, to kind of drum up the attention and maybe force the league's hand. Maybe it's because talks are happening. Um, could even not be expansion. This could be like relocation talks, right? Arizona has been underwater for their entire existence. So it could be that, but that was an interesting one to me. And I want to open this topic by saying, I really can't get behind the idea of the league expanding to 34 teams right now. I, that to me seems like over expansion. It seems like it's naive to say, but it seems like profit over reason in my mind. You have a, a suffering franchise in Arizona, and depending on how other markets are doing, you know, when the Florida Panthers are bad, that's not a hot market, so to speak. So I don't know that it's, it just doesn't kind of a, a click for me right away as a good idea. Doesn't click with me either. Um, and on top of the things you've already mentioned, it's a talent dilution, right? Like if you really want to have a top league with the top talent to, that self advertises itself. Having less good players in the league or having having more lower talent players in the league does not make it a better product. Yeah, your 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 talent like quotient, your talent uh, level on each team decreases on average. Yeah, uh, yes, and um that makes the game more entertaining. I will actually argue the opposite of what you guys are saying. If you look at junior hockey, it's the wild wild west. Yeah, but I'm fine. I don't think OHL is more entertaining than the NHL. It can be. You're not turning the TV off in a four nothing lead because things can happen. Now, I think the talent dilution uh, might be a little over exaggerated because as the game grows, there's more hockey players, there's more talented players. You look at the NHL skill level from the best player in the league to the worst player in the league versus like the '80s or early '90s. It's a significantly better league. The talent was way more diluted back then, despite only having like 21 teams, just because there weren't that many uh, hockey players relative to what there are now. Very quickly, if you're a parent of a young child starting hockey, put a right-handed stick in their hands, please. Can't get enough of those. Apparently, no one shoots right anymore. Please. Yeah, it didn't do anything for me. Anyways. (laughs) No, me either. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, there's a few ways to kind of break this down. So first thing, I'm going to ignore the Arizona thing because we know what a decision it is to keep them going and all the circumstance around them. Move Arizona to Houston, just do it, solve everybody's problem. But let's pretend, pretend Gary Bettman will never move Arizona Mm because he's going to freaking die with them there. There's no reason against expansion. The, The big thing right now is money. This is a league that might be getting screwed on the TV deal with all the Bally Sports stuff. They're coming out of a pandemic. They're just now... There's Ken- another regional re- network that might be giving up NHL rights too, by the way. It's Ex- compound. Exactly. And look how much money, just from expansion fees and everything, they made off of Vegas and Seattle. 
And now look how successful those two markets are and all the money they are generating for the league. Huge success stories. I mean, 32 to 34 teams makes no damn difference to me in my mind. The, the difference in terms of talent and parity and how it's minimal. Like, it's absolutely minimal. I do not care. So I am... I would obviously move Arizona first, but obviously they're not going to do that. So I'm totally fine if they want to expand to two more teams. Houston makes all the sense in the world. Biggest market in North America outside of like Mexico City that doesn't have an NHL team. They have ownership who is interested. There's a history of hockey there, and they're a natural rival for the Stars. And, you know, you can go, oh, Texas hockey? Screw you. Dallas has been a successful franchise in terms of competing, attracting fans, Generating buzz. When was the last time you ever heard any concern about Dallas as a franchise? You haven't. Hockey can very much work in Texas. And Houston's an even bigger populace, so they, in theory, should do even better. Atlanta, on the other hand, um, I understand the population thing and that their population has grown more since the thrash, Thrashers left than Quebec City's entire population as is. Um. And I understand the lack of corporate dollars with Quebec versus Atlanta. It, it's hard to say because when the Thrashers left, it wasn't a fan issue. It was a poor ownership issue. And I, who was it? I can't remember if it was Friedman or LeBron on a podcast I was listening to the last couple of days brought up a great point. Look at every successful franchise, and I think he was talking about this in reference to Arizona, but this would apply if they do the same thing with Atlanta too. Stable ownership in a downtown arena. When was the last time a team had that and failed? It hasn't. If you can have a good population, stable ownership, and a downtown arena, you will have a successful franchise. Um, could Atlanta be that? In theory, yes. I mean, the Thrashers had one of the worst ownership groups in hockey we've seen in a long, long time. And, you know, they had to get the hell out of there so fast the owners basically left the keys on the table. Are they my first or second choice to get if, if they decide to expand? Of course not. Yeah. Absolutely not. You've had two chances at it. Fair or unfair to the people of Atlanta because of the ownership situations? You've had two cracks at this. If If they were, like legitimately selling out every game and yada, yada, yada. The owners would make money and they wouldn't have incentive to move. I understand the Quebec City thing with no corporate dollars, but my argument to that is always Winnipeg. If it can work in Winnipeg, it can work in Quebec City. And you can't argue, okay, well, Seattle had to get the team because the team needed to go out west. Well, Atlanta would be in the same division that Quebec City would be in in all likelihood. So who cares? So I, I'm very okay with it if they want to expand to two teams Houston is probably number one on everybody's list as they should be for all the reasons I laid out I just Atlanta is not my second team you want to know something and and I know there's going to be folks who are going to be like oh my god shut up you nerd <laughs> uneven conferences uneven conferences or sorry uneven divisions shut up you nerd oh uh, like I get it <laughs> like odd numbers of teams in the conferences like uh I don't know it just doesn't so here, here's devil's advocate on this. That would almost force them to give you what you want. Oh. And I'm talking to you specifically, Ryan. Yeah, I know. They would have to go back to a 1-8. to eight. I would happily take that. I would take that trade off. I'd go up to 34 if it meant going back to 1-8. through eight. They would have to because it would be an unfair competitive advantage to the two divisions that would have less teams. They've done that before, though. They have, but there's already been enough pressure to get back to 1-8 to eight that if all of a sudden the management in the NHL starts going, hey, 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 not fair. Mm -hmm. They would go back to it because everybody was okay with it for the last couple of years because we knew Vegas was coming. We knew Seattle was coming. So it's like, yeah, it's an unbalance for now, but that's going to be resolved soon. Um, yeah, if they if they just went back to a 1-8 to eight and then threw Atlanta, Quebec City, whoever you want, into the east and then Houston into the west, it works. The NHL right now is also in a, a race with the MLS who is heavily outpacing them to grab more of the market in America in terms of viewership, um, soccer, football. Don't get mad at me. I genuinely don't care. Um, in the United States has been growing rapidly and Detroit, Detroit, the NHL is very much on the outside looking in based on the momentum that things have. So you can also see the business decision to get into more big markets like that is more eyes on those games and that's just kind of a trampoline upwards 
someone, uh, I can't remember who it is, who it is, but who always says this, but, you know, Quebec City versus Montreal would be one of the most, you know, intense, entertaining, fantastic rivalries to have back in the modern NHL. Everyone in Quebec City is already watching the NHL. Folks in Houston aren't necessarily. Uh, uh, Folks in Kansas City aren't necessarily already. Folks in Atlanta have probably tuned out. I don't think they all became Winnipeg Jets fans. All I'm hearing is Mexico City when you speak. You know what? I'm here for it. It's, Let's go. If there's an appetite. Anyhow, I'm curious to see where this one goes. I wouldn't be surprised if this turns into like, oh, my God, you people will buy anything. But I don't know. It, 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 it's a lot of money to look away from. So I wouldn't be surprised if the NHL is moving in this direction. Let's jump into overtime here. Um, overtime on this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Again, patreon.com slash Winged Wheel Podcast if you want to support the show. It is how the show keeps going. Um, they, they our patrons are the reason we're able to do everything that we do, including all of our support for the Jamie Daniels Foundation. You get access to our uh, Patreon exclusive overtime episodes, which record right after this. You get access to the Winged Wheel Podcast Discord, as well as being entered into all of our giveaways automatically. We're giving away two tickets to every Detroit Red Wings home game, the vast majority of them going to our patrons. Again, patreon.com slash winged wheel podcast. Also, if you're uh, on Twitter or would consider being on Twitter, follow us at winged wheel pod. Um, it's a good time. And then follow our uh, personal accounts listed in the bio. Glenn Brabham says, am I the only one who thinks we dodged a massive bullet with the JVR non-deal? He's old crap and way too expensive, but it seems like every media outlet thought giving up picks for him was a good plan. If he came with one or more of Philly's decent picks coming our way, then sure. But giving up assets for him would have been a boneheaded move. No, I feel like I'm living in the upside down. Please help me out here. Well, you are living in the upside down because you're in Australia, Glenn. Um, My understanding of the JVR deal, and I don't have a specific like what pick it would have been in mind or or, uh, like in terms of solid information, but I'm fairly certain the idea was um, it was going to be, you know, the Red Wings were shipping someone else out in their roster and just to kind of give the team someone else to play with, someone who could shoot the puck, someone who could play forward for them and, and just fill those minutes with some veteran experience, they were going to bring in JVR, salary retained most likely for a low pick, like think of like fifth-ish round. Um, I I know Philly's ask was higher. I think we were talking before the podcast, Brad. Philly's initial ask going into the trade deadline on JVR was a second-round pick nothing no. came to that. So they lowered the ask to a third round pick. And that was a league wide ask. Like, Hey, if anybody wants JVR for a third, here you go. And again, nobody really stepped up. So you got to assume the worst case scenario of Detroit did make that deal would have been a third round pick. Yeah. I, I don't think that they would have, I, I can't say for sure, but I don't think that they were there. I think the last minute nature of all of that lends to it just being, you know, Philly really coming down on their ass and just trying to get anything. But Detroit was only going to do it if they were selling someone else. As to who they were selling, I've heard every single, like a bunch of different names. So I can't say concretely there. Uh, Flow TCast, who's a brand new name level sponsor. Welcome, Flow TCast, to the Dub Dub Club. And thank you for the support. Says, What's up, boys? Big fan of the show. Back in 09, I vaguely remember uh, reading something stating that Ken Holland would only be able to sign either Franzen or Hossa along with Zetterberg to long-term extensions. He obviously chose Franzen. Do you guys think in a hypothetical world if Kenny signed Hossa instead, the cup window would have been open much longer? Or better yet, he would have scored 50 in a season. I love Mule, so I hate this topic. Um, But Hossa ended up objectively being the better player after that point. However, Hosa, the difference between Hosa and Franzen was not the gap that prevented the Wings from winning more cups. They should have won in 09. They should have won a bunch under Babcock, but uh, that's, a, that's a subject I don't want to relive. Uh, this one from OK Fine Dump Out Cider it says, I know a trade for up for Bedard isn't in the realm of possibility, but what about a trade up into the top three for one of these other superstars in this year's draft? I know it would take a haul. Uh, and would take away from our top tier prospect pool. But with everyone understanding that we aren't going to be cup contenders without a superstar and us realizing that we don't have one of those in the pipeline, why not do everything possible to obtain one in a draft where you don't need the top tip pick to get one? What would it take in terms of a trade package to get into the top three? You're on the right track. Um, I think that would be something the Red Wings should do. I don't think any of the teams in the top three will consider it. 
Um, you're probably giving up uh, your first round pick, the Islanders' first round pick, and probably Edvinson or Casper. Oh, you think it would be? Mm, it would be that much. That's steep. I wouldn't do it, but that's going to be the ask. That's steep. That is very steep. I think you're better served to get a, a, a lay of the land and try to think of where um, folks are on Michkov. Because if you can get Michkov at pick, you know, four to eight, I don't know where he's going to land. Try to pinpoint that and trade into that range. I agree. Because um, Michkov isn't coming over for three years or till after three years. Uh, but the Red Wings aren't in their contender window till then anyway. So that wouldn't bother them. The thing is, if you're hoping Michkov uh, is going to slide, Michkov uh, lately is doing a very good job of ensuring that won't happen. Yeah, he has been, been on a tear. Yeah, because he's an unreal hockey player. Yeah, yeah. Like if if he didn't have the Russian factor, he's like, don't get me wrong, I love Fantilli, but Michkov is the no doubt uh, with a stamp number two pick in this draft. Bertuzzi is straight up missing. Says, what is the solution to our power play struggles? Obviously, better players would help. Is it a problem with the individual t- or or team creativity? Is it a coaching slash systems issue? I'm starting to lean towards it being a coaching slash systems issue. Feels like we get going, then the opponents opponents scout us, and we go 0 for 16 over the next couple of games. All of the above. The Red Wings don't have enough talent to be able to, uh, I don't know how else to phrase this, improvise a power play when things when the system breaks down. I think the system isn't good. Um, I think they're, <laughs> just to get into the zone is atrocious. If they don't win the offensive zone faceoff at the beginning of the power play, they're they're missing 45 seconds of that power play. That's just reality, unfortunately, at this point. A lot of the top power plays have a power play specialist. A guy who, and I don't know how else to phrase this, is pretty good at five on five, but when given that extra time and space can just really elevate and be an elite, elite power play player. The Red Wings don't have a single one of those on their roster. Mm -hmm. Not one. You know, because as good as Larkin, Raymond, Perron, Sider are, they do fine at five on five and they do fine on the power play, but they, they don't elevate on the power play, if if you know what I'm meaning. Um, I'm only half joking when I say one of the big answers to their power play could be Colby Barlow. <laughs> <laughs> or they, they legit do need someone like that because they're, they're net front, and I don't like calling net front, but they're we'll call it their low guy on the power play. They don't have a good one of those. The only one who is passable in that role was Bertuzzi. Yeah. Um, so that that's a huge problem. They don't have the elite shooter from the flanks, which a lot of the teams that have success in the power play is because they have an elite shooter for two reasons. One, the other team screws up and leaves him open. Or two, they have to pay so much extra attention to him, it opens up other areas. And the PK on most teams now can just play the Red Wings straight up. They don't have to overcompensate anywhere. They don't have to worry about shifting or shading. It's just, all right, we're going to play the middle. Good luck. And the Red Wings can't get to it because they don't have any threats from the outside. Not one. CJ Wilkinson, who's a new patron. Welcome, welcome, CJ. Uh, and thank you so much uh, for the support. Says, hey, boys, been a listener for a long time and love the content enough that I decide to join the Patreon. I love that we seemed... Uh, to load up on draft picks during this trade deadline. But my question is, do we have any prospects that you think could potentially make the jump to the Red Wings next season and make an impact? Also, what do you think the path for Kosa looks like next season? Seeing the tear he's on in Toledo at the moment, do you think he stays there next year or does he spend more time in Grand Rapids? On Kosa, you'd hope he spends more time in Grand Rapids. He, uh, I'll go further to say he better spend yeah. the entire season in Grand Rapids. Like he, He'll be in his 20s at that point, 21, I think. Uh, he damn well better be in Grand Rapids for the entirety of next year. Um, for the other part of the question, I mean, okay, well, I'll say impact just means like a guy who can play regular minutes and not drown. Because, you know, again, it's it's hard to hold players to the Cider Raymond expectation. Like even Bear Grin's massively overperforming expectations. And he's kind of like a third line, fringy second line guy. Yeah. Um, Edvinson should. Um, And I would bet he will. I think Edmondson will play the full season with the Red Wings, and I think he'll look at least adequate doing it. I'm not sold on Edmondson over Johansson permanently first. Does that make sense? I could see them playing it very patient with Edmondson. I could as well. Uh, Training camp will will say that. But, yeah, I mean, as much as I love 
Johansson, and I, I kind of love the way he approaches the game more than Edvinson. Edvinson's just so much more talented than he is. Yeah. When you're when you're talking tools and frame and what he can bring to a blue line, Edvinson and Johansson aren't comparable. But because Johansson is a little more polished in his game, he makes up the gap that way. But if Edvinson gets anywhere near as polished as Johansson is, it it's not a competition. Does that, if that makes sense? Yeah, no, I get that. I don't hear a lot of people talking about Marco Casper making an impact on this team la- next year, and I'm wondering why. I because think- he's got a, I'm not going to say like an overwhelming chance, but he's one of the best U20 players in one of the best uh, leagues outside of the NHL. Like Everything about his game was, going into his draft, was he's so refined. His game's so polished. He's got a 200-foot game. There's more skill there than you gave credit for. And all he's done this season and go is go out and prove any every single one of those uh, reasons to be very true. And I find there's less talk now about him being a full time Red Wing next year. Like I, I would give Casper a very fair chance at cracking this roster next year and and being a middle six contributor, may, possibly even at center, which is his natural position. It's going to sound stupid. This is going to sound like a really obvious statement. But the only thing I could I think would put a stop on that is if Casper comes over and just doesn't adjust quickly. Well, that's true. That's true of this say of every prospect ever. Right? No, I, I get that. But you think of like a Soderblom type season where he came over and he made the team out of camp and it was fantastic. But all in all, he still had an adjustment period, which is why he's down in Grand Rapids right now. I don't want to say that's impossible for Casper, but I I almost and this is a guess. Like I could be very wrong here, but I almost think he's either going to come in. And that translation period isn't going to be apparent and he is going to come in and make an impact based on, you know, the things that you just laid out, Brad. Or they are, like Edmondson, going to play it was safe with him and say, no, you still have a lot of things to kind of um, uh, figure out, iron out, and, and kind of build that foundation before we bring you up to the NHL. We're not going to push it full time. I will say there's some crowding in, in the forward group in terms of players competing for those positions, but I... There's a there's a very obvious spot in the future of the Red Wings where they have a Casper size hole and they need him to fill it. So I agree. It, all in all, he is geared. He is poised based on who he is as a player and a person to come in and and make it sooner rather than later. Yeah, it obviously goes with the asterisks. Any prospect that comes into camp and has a poor camp isn't going to make it. But my my hope for optimism is, or my reason for optimism is, what part of Marco Casper's game like would make you think he wouldn't translate to North American game. His he is built for the North American game. Yeah. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh we're gonna wrap up this episode of the Winged Wheel Podcast. We have a Chicago game to go uh cover. Uh thank you all so much for listening. All of our new listeners, welcome to the show. Uh all of our listeners of old, thank you for sticking with us and uh again for continually putting us in the top five of uh hockey podcasts in America that is Every time it happens, we like even though it happens often, we keep sending it in our group chat and just go, "Holy shit!" <laughs> it's crazy every single time. Yeah, so we really, really, really appreciate your support. Um, if you want to support the show and and you can't necessarily do Patreon, um, you can leave us a rating wherever you get your podcast: Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, anywhere else. It really helps. Uh, make sure you hit the subscribe button. And uh, if you do want to support us on Patreon, patreoncom slash podcast, it does mean the world to us. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our name level sponsors on Patreon. Arjun Shanker, Eves Bartels on behalf of the Sarah Grand Foundation, Ake Fur, Bertuzzi is straight up missing, Nick Perks, Icon, Terry Driver for the number 69, Crying Ryan, Handis Banana, Slam and Jamathong, Glenn Brabham, Aiden White, Jordan Bernaski, uh, who's a new name level sponsor. Welcome, Jordan, and thank you for joining the Dub Dub Club. Keenan O'Donoghue, Yanni Burgers, Meals on Wheels, Matthew M. Rice, Croner's Left Knee, Babe Landeskog, Bert Baconator, who's a brand new name level sponsor. Welcome, Bert Baconator. Carl Brutana Nanaluski, Chimmy, Chris P, Citizen High Five, Connor Scovey, Coyote Season Tickets in Tempe, Denny's Gamer Girl, Derek Enstam, Detroit Rob, DJ Denton, Give Blood Fight Probert, Hassam Al Qasem. I miss dogs interrupting the podcast TBH. <laughs> oh god. Jay Gollum, Jacob Turner, Joel Miranda, Joseph Barry, Kaylin Wood, Kevin James, King Tone. Las Ensaladas Picantes, Marcus, Massive Wong, Evan Longsaber, Matt McKay, Michael Edland, Nadelkovich, goalie number one, Nicholas Fritz, R.A., Scott Martin, 
Send it, Seawolf. That's what I appreciate about you. Why do you always do this to me, Brad? General Andy Bohan of the Cheesebag Army. Sam Bankson, number one Detroit Red Guys fan. A. A. Ron. Adam Gowitska. Uh, Adam Rose. Adam, I hope I'm... Thank you for joining Patreon. I hope I'm saying your uh, name right. Adam Rose, Antonio Gracias, Ben Barron, noted Philip Zadina Whisperer, Brad Simmons, Brian Vasha, CJ Wilkinson, Connor Leighton, Corey Prida, Darren Fick, Flo Tcast, George's biggest fan, Grand Rapids hockey guy, Griffey Boy, James Laporte, Jeremiah Dobo, J.M. Rhapsody, John Evans, John Ingalls, Josh Yelton, Kevin McCracken, Quaz, Lieutenant Matt S. of the Cheesebag Army. Thank you for the shirt, buddy. Linda Hull, Marco Casper. Uh, not even going to try to pronounce that. Maybe next time. Maximilian, Melissa Erickson, Norris Cider, who is a new name level sponsor. Welcome, Norris Cider, and thank you for the support. Oh, Ophelia, Reed, Steven, Tatar Sauce, The Hodag, The Original Bertuzzi's Lost Tooth, and finally, my favorite patron, Matt Keeler. Thank you all so very much, and we will talk to you on Sunday. Thanks for tuning in to the Winged Wheel Podcast. Be sure to check out wingedwheelpodcast.com, where you can subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. You'll also find links to other ways to support the show, such as Patreon, official podcast apparel, and more. And don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at Winged Wheel Pod. And of course, the hosts at Brad Crisco, at Ryan Hanna WWP, and at Hockey Town Evan.